You read the bulletin, and nobody ran out, so I guess I'm in good shape so far. <laughs> but I counted today, and I'm going to count after I get through today, and I might be the only one here. I <laughs> but no, I, I feel the Lord has given me a message this morning for each and every one of you, and uh, I just hope it will bless your heart this morning. Um, before we start today's message, I'd like to uh, share with you a little story. And it's a little story about Johnny. And it seemed like that all the neighborhood kids were teasing him uh, because he was stupid. Uh, their favorite joke to pull on Johnny was that they would offer him a choice between a nickel and a dime. And little Johnny would always take the nickel. And one day, uh, after Johnny had taken the nickel, a neighborhood fellow come to Johnny and he says, do you know that those kids are making fun of you? They think you're stupid. Don't you know that a dime is worth more than a nickel, even though the nickel seems bigger? Little Johnny just grinned and he said, well, if I took the dime, they'd stop doing it. <laughs> and so far, I made $20. <laughs> so, I think Johnny made a wise decision. <laughs> so, this morning, my message today is about making the right decisions. And if you have your Bibles with you today, please turn to me to Proverbs chapter 26, verse 11. And please stand as I pray and read the scripture. Father, this morning, I come to you. And I thank you, Lord, for how you prepared me for this message today. I thank you, Lord, for guiding me, instructing me, and giving me the knowledge to be able to do this. And Lord, I just thank you for those that are here to hear this, Lord, and that this message will reach those, Lord, and touch the hearts and minds of those here today, Lord. I ask, Lord, that during this time that you give me the words and the wisdom to present it. And we thank you, Lord, for this beautiful day you've given us. And we give you all the praise and we give you all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Proverbs 26, verse 11 says, As a dog returns to his own vomit, so a fool repeats his folly. You may be seated. So this morning, I've titled my message, <laughs> Rebuke the Puke. Uh, some of you may not know this or not, but uh, dogs have a tendency that if they vomit up something as sick as, sick as it may sound, they'll generally go back to it and then sometimes eat it. The same thing goes for a person who returns to his sin, or what the Bible calls it, folly. Even though it was bad the first time, he's hoping that it won't be bad again. Always remember, when this happens, he realizes that he's made a bad decision. Everyone here this morning in this house has been faced in making decisions. Some are good decisions, while others could be poor decisions. Every day brings us a different challenge in life and a different decision. We all remember September 11, 2001. How could we forget it? We witnessed America under attack. We witnessed on the television the Twin Towers collapsing, how they destroyed the Pentagon. And we seen people in panic. We seen people crying. We seen people in total shock in what was happening to their great country. There was mass confusion. There was total loss because they weren't expecting this. 
I remember churches that evening, they opened up their doors and people were flooded to the church. People were crying out to God because they didn't know what was going on. But you know, that fear no longer lived in their hearts. The fear that tore their hearts out was no longer there. The worry that messed with their minds were gone. They didn't need God anymore after it was over. They totally forgot who He was. In Psalms 11.10, it reminds us that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. They didn't fear God. They only feared what was happening. Mm -hmm. And in doing so, they went back to their own ways. <clears throat> Every one of us here in this church today has had to make a decision. Whether we felt it was right or whether we felt the decision was wrong, we still had to make it. Sometimes in life, we have to make good decisions. And those decisions may be like for a healthier lifestyle, maybe dieting, maybe oh, exercising. I don't really want to do that, you know. I, I just want to take a pill that they can get rid of it, you know. Uh, Maybe it's going to college, or maybe it's just bettering ourselves uh, in our job field. Whatever it is, we had to make a good decision about it. But sometimes we make a bad decision. And that would be like uh, when we get into temptations, like maybe gambling, maybe stealing, maybe involved in drugs. Those are all bad decisions, and they don't help us with our walk of life. And then sometimes we have to make hard decisions. Like making crucial decisions involving a family member. I know years, years ago, my mother suffered four and a half years with Alzheimer's. And it was, as Didi would say, it's, it's the long goodbye because she didn't know any of us. And my dad had to make a crucial decision in her health because the medicine that they were giving her to help her with the Alzheimer's was destroying the platelets in her blood. So she had to go through a series of blood transfusions. Started out doing it once a year. Then it went to once every six months. Then it went to once every month. And then it got down to the point where it was once every week. And I felt sorry for her because every time I'd go in there and they wanted to find a vein to do this, her arms and her ankles were so chewed up with needle marks. And you could tell on her face she didn't want to go through this. So they decided they would put a central line in her neck. But then my dad had to make that decision. Is it worth it? And he decided, no, we're not going to do it. It'd been nice if they could have done it and they could have brought my mom back to where she was, to where she'd recognize anything, but that wasn't going to happen. So he decided not to do it. They gave her six months. She made it two and a half weeks. And I was thinking about that, you know. You know, Jesus went to the cross and he spilled his blood on Calvary. Blood is a vital thing. Mm -hmm. He did that because he loved us. If we go back into the history books, you can see that many of our presidents and world leaders also had to make crucial decisions to shape our world today. That's why it's important that each and every one of us should pay, pray for our president and our vice president and those that are serving under him. This country is in bad shape, folks. It is. We need God in this, back in this country. We need God back in our schools. We need people coming to church. So I encourage you, if you know neighbors, friends, relatives, get them started. This is where you grow. Many of us have studied history. Some of us have remembered an explorer by the name of Hernan Cortez. Now around the year of 1518, he commanded an expedition to Mexico with more than 500 men and 11 ships. Upon reaching the Mexican coastline in the New World, his men become restless. They become weak. 
because of the hardships brought on by the new world. His men wanted to go back. They wanted to sail back to, to the land that they loved. But Cortez made a decision to burn the ships. I've enjoyed Stephen Curtis Chapman, the, the Christian songwriter, and he wrote a song about it, Burn the Ships. And it says, burn the ships, we're here to stay. There's no way we could go back now that we've come this far, far by faith. Burn the ships, we pass the point of no return. Our life is here, so let the ships burn, let them burn. As Christians, we should never look back to our past. We need to continue to run the race. Second Timothy, Paul reminds us in chapter 4, verse 7, saying, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. As Christians, we need to continue looking forward with strong faith and endurance to finish our race to the end. We need to be like sharks, and many of you don't know this, but, did, but sharks cannot swim backwards. It's because of their gills. If they swim backwards, their bodies fill up with water and they eventually drown. So we never should go back in what we are doing. We should always look ahead. The same thing happens when we do take a step back if we're not careful, we fall back to the same old hole that sometimes is hard to get back out of. You ever wonder why they have small rear view mirrors in cars? Simply because they want you to have a better and bigger picture of what's out in front of you. They don't want you to look back. They want you to look forward. It's the same plan that God wants us to have for our lives. He wants us to not look back. He wants us to look forward. He wants us to forget the past. He wants us to look towards our future. He wants us to make the right decisions and live the fullness He has promised us. Remember, decisions you make today will determine your destiny. So I encourage you to choose wisely. Let us turn to Genesis chapter 3, starting with verse 6, going to verse 13. Starting with verse 6. And it says, So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and the tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were open, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together, and made themselves covered. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree which I commanded you that you should not eat? Then the man said, The woman who you gave to me with me, she gave of the tree, and I ate. And the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. Here we find right out of the first book of the Bible that a decision was made that changed the course of the world. 
Adam and Eve turned away from what God had instructed them. But notice that when the decision was made, they put blame on someone else. Now I can imagine this conversation between Adam and the Lord. I can imagine said, well, Lord, me and you were doing real good here until you brought her along. And then you brought her along, and what does she do? She feeds me an apple. And then what does he do? The Lord goes to eat. Well, Lord, you know I don't like snakes. I don't know why you made one. You know he tempted me. I had to do something. So I ate. You know, the problem is, is when we get into a, a, a situation like this, we always want to put blame on somebody else. Uh, you know, Adam blamed Eve for his downfall. Then Eve blamed the servant. We need to know that we should be responsible for every decision that we make. You know, if I told you or told George here, George, don't go in my yard. I got a pit bull in there and he's going to eat you alive. And George decides to go in my yard and he eats him alive. You know, there's nothing I can do. He made the decision to go in there. So any decision that you make, you're going to have to pay for it sooner or later. But we immediately see, again, that Eve's, tempta Eve's decision was based on temptation. She sees the tree, knowing that God instructed her not to do it, she did it anyway. You know, you know there's people in this world that's going to try to convince you that the grass is always greener on the other side. But you know what? I'm going to let you know something. It's not. You know, if you don't change the direction you're going, then you're likely going to end up where you're headed. Now, I had a friend. Name was Austin. And I love this kid. He's about... 20, 22, something like that. But Austin made some bad decisions. He got started in drugs. And, you know, it started with maybe the marijuana. And he got to the point where, hey, I need something a little more than that. So he got into heroin. And then when he got into heroin, then he had to support his habit. So it started stealing. It was tearing his family apart. They tried to get him in rehabilitation. They'd take him to a rehabilitation center. Two days later, he'd walk out. Rehabilitation centers, they don't keep you there. If you want to walk out, you can walk out any time you want to. But it's going to have to be Austin's decision to stay. Well, it was a couple Easter's from that. I seen him at church. And he looked a little different. His eyes were a little clearer. His complexion looked a little, lot nicer. But then what happened? He found him a job up in Springfield, Illinois. And then he started his habit again. He made a wrong decision. And one evening, some friends of his come in and decided to give him some pills. Hey, this will help you. So he made a decision to take them. It knocked him out. They don't know how long he lay in his apartment in the position that he was in. But by the time they got him to the hospital, they told the family he had a 1% chance of living. Uh, <coughs> due to the fact that he laid on his side for so long, it cut the circulation off of one of his legs, and he had to have that removed also. 23-year-old kid losing a leg over drugs. But I'm hoping right now he's learned his lesson. He seems like, I haven't talked to him, but I've been reading some of his Facebook stuff, and it seems like that he's turning around. He's finally seeing the, the light in the tunnel. But it's all because of bad decisions that that, that kid made. You know, I love this quote that says that most people mess up something good by looking for something better just to end up with something worse. And that's what happened to Austin. Um, let's go to Jonah chapter 1, verses 1 through 6. 
And we're going to see a decision here that was made by Jonah. And it says, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Midiah, saying, Arise and go to Nineveh, the great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah rose and fled to Tarish from the presence of the Lord, he went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Torish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Torish from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord sent out a great wind on the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship was about to be broken up. Then the mariners were afraid. And every man cried out to his God and threw the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten the load. But Jonah had gone down into the lowest part of the ship and laid down and was fast asleep. So the captain came to him and said to him, What do you mean, sleeper? Arise, call on your God. Perhaps your God will consider us so that we may not perish. And they said to one another, Come, let us cast lots, that we may know, for who caused this trouble has come upon us. So they cast lots, and the lots fell on Jonah. We find reading in this scripture that Nineveh was a very corrupt city. There was greed, there was prostitution, there was false gods. You name it, it was there. And God wanted Jonah to go to Nineveh and preach and hope that things would get better in that city. So when God said, rise and go, Jonah rose and fled. Jonah made a decision to do the complete opposite of what God told him to do. So he went, to jo uh, he went to Joppa, he boarded a ship to get away from the Lord. You know, I feel that Jonah was playing hide and seek with the Lord. But you know, if you play hide and seek with the Lord, it's not going to be a fun game. <laughs> because the seeker's going to know where you're at all the time. And if you look back in a couple of scriptures, we find in verse 3 that it says that he found a ship going to Torish paid his fare, and went down. Everyone say, went down. Went down. Yeah. Into it to get away from the presence of the Lord. Then we go to verse 5, and it says that the mariners were afraid, and every man cried out to his God and threw the cargo that was in the ship into the sea. They made a decision there. They wanted to save their lives, to lighten the load. But Jonah had gone down. Say down. Down into the lowest part of the ship and had laid down and was fast asleep. I look at that and I see every decision that was made by Jonah on that ship, he went further down. He started up here, he kind of moved down, he kept moving down. If you're doing the wrong thing in the righteous way in which it can be done, it doesn't make it right. Mm -hmm. If you go against the Lord's will, it's still sinful. There are always going to be a decision that you're going to make in everything we do. So keep in mind that in the end, the decision you make, it will either break you or it's going to make you. Proverbs 3, 5, 6 says that we need to trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on to his own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your path. When we put all our faith in the Lord, he will give us direction and make in order to make that right decision. No matter what the odds are against us, God's faithfulness will always come true. 
But as Christians, how do we go about making the right decisions? What do we need to know? Well, I'm going to tell you. I got six steps here that will hopefully help you when making the right decision. The most important one that we need to do is we need to pray. We all need to connect with God. We need to ask Him for direction in our decision process. There's a saying that says, if you don't know where you're going, how are you going to know when you get there? <laughs> you need to ask the Lord. He'll provide you. He's your GPS. If you put your trust in Him, He will provide guidance. There's nothing to worry about. Just a little talk with Jesus is all you need. Number two, you need to trust your instincts. Whether it's a new job or maybe buying a new car, it doesn't mean to jump at the first thought. To avoid complication, complica complicating situations, it might be helpful just to step back a while. Take a deep breath. Focus on what you felt when you started making this decision process. I remember one time I was one in a van. Chevrolet Astro Band. And oh, I just, I needed that. And I went out to, I did all my car shopping when the dealership was closed because I just hate <laughs> to talk to dealers. I mean, it just, I feel sometimes that they're, they're going to get more out of me than what I'm going to pay for that car, you know. And I wanted this thing. And I, what I did, I walked around it three times and I just kept praying. Lord, if this is your will, this is the one I want right here. And he'll make it happen. It may not have been the color I want, but I ended up getting the car. But he'll help you. Just pray. Stay focused. And then number three, establish a circle of trust. You know, instead of asking everyone that knows you, how about only refer to your Christian friends? Ask them for advice. I know every Christian person would be happy to help you make that decision. If you need more advice, ask your pastor. That's what he's here for. He will always guide your, allow you to have uh, spiritual guidance in making those decisions. But remember that the final decision is going to be up to you. Number four, ask questions. Many times the pressure can make you anxious to move forward before you had time to weigh out your options. Do your homework. Like I said earlier, I don't like to deal with cars, but I come to a, I guess you'd say a plan I come to that I do a lot of my stuff over the internet. So I look up the car that I'd like to have, and I get a price on it. Then I look up to see if there's any rebates on that particular automobile. See if there's any sales going on. Then I take the price of that vehicle and I knocked $2,000 off of it. That gives me a chance to do a little, whatever you call them, dickering with, with the salesman. And then I take the value of my car I'm going to trade. Look it up. Subtract that off there. And then I'm ready to go to the salesman and do my, my studies. And sometimes I found out it works really good. <laughs> if you hold your ground, you can get usually walk out of what you want. Next, practice makes perfect. Number six, the more often you're faced with making tough decisions, the more confidence that you're going to have when you make those decisions. I'd like to close here uh, with this quote that I thought it was funny when I was getting the message ready. And you see it all the time. And it says that the highway of life is filled with flat squirrels who couldn't make a decision. <laughs> it's true. And every one of us here today is a result of a decision that we made yesterday. Every one of us thought, tomorrow I'm going to go to church. I'm going to be in the house of the Lord. And I'm glad you are. I'm glad you made that decision. But today I ask with every head bowed and no one looking around.
this morning, you have heard how important decisions can be made and how they can affect the ones around us. So I ask you this morning to search your heart. And if any of you are facing a decision that you are struggling with, I ask that you raise your hand. <coughs> or maybe you are the one letting others make your decision so that you are living the life that they want you to live. If that's you, slip your hand up, put it back down. Or maybe you're having a difficult time in deciding to accept Jesus in your heart. If that's you, slip your hand up and quickly put it down. You know, this morning, Jesus saw your hands. He knows who you are. Just like Adam, just like Eve, just like Job, you can't stay hidden from the Lord. So I ask you today, if that's you, the altars are open. He'll meet you here. But that decision is yours. <laughs> 